Greetings, slayers and sycophants. It's time to talk some Morka about some Borka. Part Forka. I had three sessions since the last time I posted a Borka recap video, and all three of those sessions have gone pretty darn well. What I don't feel like doing in this video is going through a complete session recap of each one of those, in part because my videos, especially last one, uh, tend to run a little long. Hey, just kidding, actually. There was a poll to see if y'all wanted shorter videos or longer videos or something in the middle, and the long videos actually won. So, let's get straight to the recap. This is for the session, Hunger. Hi, Editor Jackson here. I thought it would be a good idea to shoot out some nice reminders of who the freaking party is. Uh... Sorry to cut away again like this. I I promise, truly, this is the last big jump cut like that. Uh, this is the video you're watching now. So we have our four players who are all level five to level six at the time of this adventure. Lord Reth Nobriskov, he is a tabaxi warlock, uh, Path of the Hexblade. Uh, he is a fearsome member of the Nine. We have Zatan Graves. Uh, of the of Liskova house, kind of representing them, but they are a Scalamancer. They are a reborn warlock of the Great Old One. We have Lady Camellia Praetorius, the Fire Dancer. She is a Fearbolg Druid, Circle of the Stars, and we have Lord Light Ritter, the Trendsetter. He is a reborn bard, College of Creation. Do enjoy the recap. Goodbye. The four investigators are on the trail of the red-eyed enchanter that caused turmoil at the Olzanic auction. They also keep their senses poised on the four podlings who could be disguised as humanoids in the area. Traveling by the carriage of Mr. Jobak, a centaur cabbie, uh, that was actually a spot where I... I was kind of fumbling and being like, I don't know, I guess there's a cabbie, I don't know what his name would be, and the players were like, ooh, ooh, what if, what if he's not, like, a cabbie, what if he's just a centaur, like, driving the carriage, and we'll roll a random name, and I was like, okay, cool, that's canon now. They stop by Levcarest before heading south. Lord Light releases Mr. Porco to hire guards for the upcoming Ritter auction, and Zatan offers Mr. Porco use of his contacts. Zatan wants to ensure that the body of Sorge is tended to, so he delivers the unsavory parcel to the first sister of Ezra he sees. Sister Rong, cleric of Ezra, the Stain sister, is keen to take in the old gravedigger's corpse and offers Zatan a reward for his efforts. The ruby road at the walls of Levkarest's outer burrows, the party hears rumbling wheels and howling beasts. The town watches. Watchers cry out for aid, as their shoddy wall is assailed by dogmen with a battering ram. The party considers letting the matters of the countryside slide in favor of their own safe travels, but interest is piqued when Darsan Pietrata comes galloping forth to fight back the monsters. This is nice, so basically I said, oh, here's kind of a random encounter. There's a bunch of gnolls attacking uh, the village. What are you going to do? And my party, the players, did say like, oh, well, we don't really care about that because they were playing their nobles. Why would they care? Uh, so I had already kind of planned, well, here's your motivation. One of the other nobles that you met at the party and who kind of helped you, but you have some suspicions about happen to be there. So already have those little motivational hooks set up as you're going into what could otherwise just be random violence. At the head of the Null Pack is a venom-tailed Shusava demon that mentally grapples with wrath. The investigators prove formidable against these mongrels, yet it is Darsan who claims the killing blow on the Shusava. This briefly foils the curse on the dogmen, with the remaining leader turning into a hungry dwarf farmer, the Shusava had exacerbated the hunger of these poor peasants with the possible catalyst of a mace of terror in the dwarf's possession. The mace of terror was actually there because at the start of the game, I had handed out uh, a lot of these magic item cards that you find in the Dungeon Master's Guide. And I told my players, hey, pick out ten of these. 
that you might like to find or that your character might like to find, give them back to me and I'll shuffle them up and that'll be kind of the random item pile that I go to. So my players actually helped make that and either by random completely or uh, by me saying, oh, okay, this item would actually be a really good spot to give to this NPC, I'm able to build out the loot pile in an interesting way. Even without the demon, the hunger pangs and grudge against the nobility was all too real. Rothbert the dwarf gives in to the hunger before being put down by the party. So I want to reincorporate, keep reincorporating this theme that we see in Van Richten's guide and the section on Borka that the central horror of Borka as a realm of Ravenloft is that the nobility uh, has control over your life. Even if you're far removed from them and a peasant, uh, their dealings in this case that uh, the Tatena were not watching the wall, and that the Parliament of Lev Karest, as well as Ivana Baritsi herself, was not tending to the needs of the villagers. This all contributed to a factor where this evil Shusava demon was able to uh, use the peasants' hunger as a catalyst to create this situation. Again, we're, we're incorporating some themes and some motivations into what otherwise would have just been random violence. After the bloody skirmish, Darsan thanks the party for their timely aid and invites them to his family's estate. Zatan voices aloud that Darsan's victory was a little too convenient, but the last night of Piechota shows his cutting words no heed. Given the strange change in events, the party chooses to split up, with Zatan and Camellia heading back to Levkarest while Light and Reth go to the Pietrata estate ahead of Darsan. If this storyline seems a little muddled, that's okay because that reflects what happened in the game. Uh, they were on the road, coming back from the graveyard encounter and the body snatcher plant, from last time, and everyone was kind of waffling on, like, oh, I think I want to go to the city and buy some stuff, or, well, I kind of want to just follow Darsan. So there was a party split, and that is not that is not a forbidden act in my games. In fact, sometimes I think that can lead to some pretty good drama down the road because the party had separated. Back in Levkarest, Zatan seeks out Hadriana Tatena. Through clever sleuthing, he arrives at a private erotic party at a club bought out by the debaucherous heiress. Zatan takes the shape of Darsan and the name of Panther, as he uses the party's odd games to earn a seat next to Hadriana's ear. So, we kind of played out this whole party thing that I'm not going to completely describe on YouTube. It wasn't it wasn't totally X-rated. I'd say it, it was PG-13 or R-rated. Uh, and, you know, if everyone at the table is is down for that and says, yeah, Eyes Wide Shut party, sure, why not? Uh, for To play out as the characters, of course. Then that's okay. So that's what we played out. Da -da 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 -da. He notes Hadriana's ring of telekinesis and her wanton use of noble funds meant for repairing the burrow's walls. By silver tongue and naked ass, Zatan manages to place Darsan in dour graces with Hadriana while obtaining the magical map she won at the auction. Quick note here, so uh, I will I have encountered frequently DMs who do not like uh, abilities of turning into other people, like disguise self. Warlock, one of their invocations is you can dis disguise self at will. Currently, two people in my party have this ability, one through the Warlock class, one through the use of a feat. And I'm okay with that. They played into that. They heard that this was going to be a high intrigue uh, political situation with a lot of players, so they wanted the ability to turn into other people. And I said, sure, okay. In general, as a DM, I don't think you should be afraid of the stuff that is in the books, uh, as long as it is fun. If there are things in the book that you think are, are not fun for you or anyone else at the table, then yeah, maybe those are the spots where you say, uh, can we not do this? But I clearly saw that this was a very fun thing for both of these players to pick. It was 
going to have a powerful effect in the game. Uh, the one part that has been difficult for me is I, I'm a very visual person. I'm picturing the game's events as it's happening, and I'm using that for my descriptions. And sometimes it's hard for me to, when I say the name Zatan, I'm picturing this uh, plague mask wearing Scalamancer warlock. I'm not picturing whoever he's disguised self as. So that's a small hurdle for me to get over. But if I do something like I grab the mini of the person that he is turning into and I just put that behind my DM screen, that's a good note to me, that reminder. That's, that's what shape he's being. Camellia is invited to an impromptu showing at the Glassblower's Guild. She impresses the Guildmaster, an attendee of the Olzanic Auction. For her gift and her performance, she is given a magical staff of glass. On her way through the glassworks, she spots a sanctified room for stained glass which contains sketches of Sorge's likeness. So this whole thing going on with Sorge and or Sorge's corpse and the glass blowers and Sister Wrong actually came from a random encounter table for gothic horror in Van Richten's guide. I didn't just take that as it was. I didn't roll that on the table. What I do, how I use random encounter tables is I go through and I will I'll take a highlighter and I'll tick off the ones that I like and then I'll move that over into my own table. What I did for Borka this time is I also grabbed a bunch of magic cards. I was doing this to kind of set the mood, you know, make a mood board for here's what I am picturing Borka looks like so I can show to the players uh, to get a visual feel. And if you play magic, you may have already guessed that like Innistrad is a very good flavor fit for Borka, so I happen to be using a lot of newer Innistrad cards. So what I'll do is I'll take a picture on a card that I like. I'll assign that to a number on the random encounter table. So that when I go to choose a random encounter for a situation like this, where half of the party was like, we want to just go to the city and not do whatever we were going to do tonight, I can say, cool. And rather than rolling a die, which they hear, uh, I can draw a magic card for myself and be like, okay, so we're doing the stained glass thing, all right? I got a, I got a picture here of a nun, all right, cool, scene. Uh, I use this later on to hand out the magic cards to the players, and I'll do little games like, okay, why don't you hand me back ones that you don't want? We'll look at the pile that's left, and y'all vote on the art that you want to see tonight. And when they hand me that card back, that's the random encounter. So it's less random, but again, the players got to have a part in the world and the story that we're playing through tonight, and I want more of that. On the road south, wrath and light disperse misunderstandings and a family rivalry of rumors. Light informs wrath of the blood drinker Lyvander, who accosted the party's dreams and claims to not be Reth's true quarry. They eventually arrive at the Pietrata estate, drab and depressing with the family's fall from fortune. Light dismisses Mr. Joback, but not without a letter for the Tatena house. He would like to inform them that the country walls they tend to were in disgraceful disrepair. But as are several for sale properties, of the Pietrotas. I love this. I love that Lord Light's player is writing these letters and he's always keeping track of little intrigue, sowing little rumors, disrupting uh, the, the status quo of the land, even when I do, am not presenting an NPC in front of him. And I think I could get really lost in the weeds as a DM and say, like, okay, are you casting Animal Messenger? Did you buy an owl? Like, that letter is going to take uh, uh, 52 hours to get to its destination before it takes effect. And what matters more than all of that, if you really want the simulationist feel and you want to sit through all that at the table, go for it. 
I don't think that's fun. What matters is I jot down, okay, the Tatenas are going to hear this, and because of their favor towards Lord Light, which I have been keeping track of as kind of a score off to the side, uh, you know, how will they respond to it? And already I know some of y'all, some other DMs will, are like, well, why would I keep track of what NPCs like other people? That's less exciting to me than keeping track of how many hours it takes for a letter-laden swallow to arrive at a certain location. That's fine. Do the style that works for you. The pair are welcomed in by the aged Pratima Piechota. The matriarch shows wrath to the room of one dead husband, Richard and shows light to a stately bath chamber, while stating a likeness to another dead husband, Hugo. Galloping hooves from Darson's steed can be heard arriving at the estate. In the hunter's bedchamber, Reth encounters a voice, coming from a red-eyed moose head mounted on the wall. While unnatural, the voice is quite charming, and tells Reth, they are called Lyvander. His social guard down, Reth bears ear to a request from Lyvander. So, this is important. Reth's character was not here when the rest of the party had this dream sequence last time, and they heard the vampire Lyvander talking to them. So, this is the reconnection here. Uh, I did not let out in this description that my players can see exactly what our secret conversation was, me and Reth's player. But he knows, and this is important too, I feel whenever I say like, ah, oh, ah, Lavander, and tell you to do this thing, I will break and say, you are under the effect of a Gios spell, it lasts for this long, it is not going to be able to be counter-charmed by Lord Light the Bard, uh, this is the thing you're going to have to do. Like, really clarify what is going on to the player in game terms so that they don't have to guess on that part and have to work around it. Just say, hey, this is doing this. One other thing I want to note is that Rhett's player actually did tell me uh, back when we were doing Session Zero with Yucks and Yums that he did not... He did not super like having his agency as a player taking away from his role-playing character. So I had to be a little careful with this and mindful of that. I didn't want to completely take out, you know, dominate person spells in the game. So what I said was, this person is going to tell you to do this thing. You have to do that thing, but you don't have to do that thing to the letter. You can, you can weave this like a bad genie right? And whatever motivation you need to make up for yourself to, I am now doing this thing, you may do. Like, anything else aside from that other than, you know, these stipulations on it, you can do. So that was important for me, rather than taking this big red paintbrush and, and just doing this to your character sheet and their personal quest, I'm just taking a tiny brush and I'm saying, here's this little red dot. You're going to have to do it. It's going to it's, it's going to be an obstacle for your character, but you can draw whatever lines you need to to be able to do this. And I, ha I am confident that this player is going to be able to work around it in such a way that he's going to pull a fast one on me and, and use the Gios to his advantage. And I love that. That's what I want. I don't want to tell him what to do with his role-playing character. Jaxi the Cobalt gives warning to Light before turning into the dragon wing bow. Zatan and Camellia arrive. Darsan allows them entrance. They all arrive at Reth's door, with Light in a hurry. Within the hunter's chamber, what shall be the state of the feline of the Nine? End of session. One quick note here. You'll notice in the recap, I'm very being very careful to kind of keep note of which NPCs and which characters are where. So that if my players are looking back over this because they're trying to solve the mystery of, like, okay, who is in the Moosehead casting a Gios spell on Wrath? Where were people? Uh, they can go back and look at that and have accurate information. During the session, 
as well. I'm trying to keep track of where all my NPCs are because this is important in, to intrigue and in a mystery campaign. Uh, you can keep notes behind your screen. You can have a secret GM layer on your Roll20 or Fantasy Grounds, whatever you use on your laptop you have set up. Uh, you can also do what I was talking about earlier with that I'm very good with because, I, again, I'm a super visual learner. Uh, I will take minis and I will set them in certain spots behind my DM screen, which will have no meaning to anybody on the other side. I don't even, I'm not even writing like room one, room two down on the table. I just know like, okay, this panel over here to the right, that's where this, this character is in the main hall. Uh, this panel over here to the left, that is the foyer. Uh, and I'll move the minis around to remind myself where these key players are at the right time. Session three, sleepwalking. Camellia, Light, and Darson find Reth quite calm in his room. Despite Jaxie's warning to Light, the bard finds nothing peculiar about the Hexblade's behavior before or after his counter charm is cast. Another surprise guest knocks on the door. Primislav Nobriskov's Reth's bestial uncle and another member of the Nine. Light requests a change in rooms, guarding Pratima's assistance. Pratima shows Light a hidden passage on the way to sprucing up a new bedchamber for Reth. She also takes precaution to keep Light out of a particular room upstairs. Pratima welcomes everyone to dinner, where discussion of recent events unfolds. Light and Reth make jibes at the Pietrata's fallen fortunes, and learn a bit about Pratima's husbands. Richard Pietrata was slain by Verderon Venn in Klaus's great hunt, leaving behind a magical harp in the dragon's lair. Hugo Pietrata, a delicate sculptor, died of illness only two years ago. I am referring back to stuff in our pre-session, or our session zero, the little game we played with Lord and Ladies, the Lorca of Borca that I wrote up from that. I do want to refer back to that. There will come a time in the campaign where I kind of say, okay, if I haven't referred to it yet, like that stuff is in the past, I'm not going to keep jumping back to this lore that we made in this board game. I want to focus more on the game we're playing now. But I'm just kind of peppering in these little callbacks so that the players are like, oh yeah, I remember making that. Because they made some cool stuff, and that helps me as a DM too, to not sit there and uh, do creative writing on a whole bunch of lore. The investigators broach the subject of the red-eyed beast in the Tunnel of Trees. Pratima says she is aware of the vampire that lives nearby, but because the vampire is reclusive and has never heard anyone from their house, the Pietritas have long let Lyvander rest. Light calls upon Pratima's magic knowledge to detect any curious auras around their party. She detects nothing unusual around Reth, as Light was hoping, but hesitates when glancing at Light and Camellia. It is mentioned that both live in a state outside of mortal life, with Light being reborn by a genie's wish, and Camellia being a plant given humanoid life with love. Camellia requests Ginefa and finds the Mentar nun of Ezra quite at home with her humble new life on the Pietrita estate. She gives her gratitude for Camellia's act, but is not able to give anything else to her savior. Light sends Camellia a message to create a distraction. Camellia initiates a contest to see if Ganefa, Darson, or Reth are the hairiest. Reth wins the outst with outstanding eagerness. This was a completely ridiculous moment where one player asked another player like hey make a distraction and and camellia's player she was like uh uh which one of you is hairiest and then they just kind of went off from this and Reth's player uh Reth is a tabaxi was like well i'm just gonna take off all my clothes it was ridiculous and i love it you should have ridiculous moments in these games
While taking a second bath, Light uses clairvoyance to catch any conversations around the house. Reth is taken away by Premislav and warned that Reth's brother, Kess, is now hunting for him. It seems that Primislav once faced a similar situation with his husband, Reth's uncle by blood, and lived to tell the tale, becoming a truly ordained member of the Nine. Primislav also gives a cryptic warning about the red-eyed vampire Lyvander having a truce with the Nine, and that Reth is not ready for such a quarry. Primislav takes his leave. This is a case where I'm kind of taking a, a metagame aspect. Uh, after we kind of said, okay, we want a vampire. Okay, vampires can cast, like, Dominate. If he was a spellcaster, he could do Gios. Like, okay, so a vampire might have been the one that cast this Gios spell. Uh, vampire spellcaster has, like, a CR of, like, 13, 16. Yeah, it's up there. We know those numbers don't matter. But it matters enough that I know that, like, a vampire is going to be more than a match for this level 6 party. So I don't want to metagame that too much. I don't want to tell them out of game, like, hey guys, don't go for the vampire, uh, or maybe think about it, like get some radiant damage or something before you go. I want to bring that in game. And the way I did that in game was I have this more experienced hunter, this, this noble member of the Nine, who's a relative to one of the characters. He comes from uh, the character's backstory to say, uh, hey, you're not ready for this. Please be careful. In part of me saying that, I'm kind of hoping that they, the party, will go like, okay, they're telling us we're not ready, but like that just means the loot and the XP is going to be really good, right? Camellia sleeps well in the Pietrata mansion. Light uses magic to create an alarm for himself and do a little more snooping on the estate. Reth, too, is restless and goes downstairs to visit Darsam. Pratima is still awake, and upon hearing Light's loud fumble while in invisibility, begins to detect magic as she patrols her house. Trying to remain calm, Light shuts himself in the forbidden room. There, he finds an undead flame skull bearing the celestial flame like that of his own reborn hair. Hearing Pratima draw near, he is unable to investigate this shade further and instead searches for a hidden passage out. Using a torch sconce to open a secret door and slide down a chute, he finds himself looking upon Darsan and Reth through a set of eye holes in the wall. Which the players guessed appropriately, he is looking through the moose head that someone was using to cast Gios on Reth earlier. So I'm having a little bit of kind of classic dungeon design. You know, we've got a haunted house. It's got some secret rooms. You never know at what point someone is walking around. And this isn't random, right? Earlier, I established when Lord Light was walking around with Pratima, uh, Pratima kind of showed him, like, Here, here's a secret room on your wall uh, that kind of builds trust with this NPC that also shows hey, there might be secret passages in this house, which also means there might be traps and things in this house. Reth questions Darsan's feelings about the vampire Lyvander being so close to home. Darsan is not nearly as content as his mother and feels the need to prove himself worthy of his family's former glory. Darsan also bears the power to call upon Radiance in combat, a skill that would make taking on the vampire a much easier task. By conversation's end, Reth seems to have garnered Darsan's support on the hunt. Meanwhile, Zatan chose to stay behind in Levkarest. He and his scholarly underlings look into the nature of the Mace of Terror, rumors of the Pietratas, and news of the red-eyed beast in the Tunnel of Trees. What he has uncovered is his to reveal as he chooses. This was my public communication to all the players that Zatan's player, who was not here, we had been texting on the side, like, okay, what do you want to do with Zatan? Uh, and he kind of 
Zatan was originally going to go down to the Piechota State with them. We kind of had to retcon. Like, let's just say he le was back in Levkarest because that's where all these things that you want to do would be. Uh, we spiced up his background feature for Sage to instead say that, like, instead of you know of a library where you can get some info, like, you have your undergraduate minions who will do research for you up to a certain extent. So I would give him some information about this stuff, and other times, you know, I would say, what is the thing that you are researching on your own? The Mace of Terror? Okay, that one I'm going to have you make some rolls on, but probably a good use because the Mace of Terror is, is very important. Party receives a long rest for whatever is to come. Will they remain complacent as the Piechotas and Novoskovs have, allowing the vampire Lyvander to live in Borka another night? Or will they strike out against an ancient evil, lest its true power come to bear? And that is how I closed off that night, and that is how I also wanted to, to broadcast to the players, like, this is a big choice. Are you going to go after Lyvander or not? And in a normal story, this is also the tee-up for, like, all the other Nubles don't care about Lyvander existing. They seem to know that this vampire is out there and probably eats a peasant or two every year, but they let it slide because he's not eating them. What would a hero do? What would a D&D &D party do? They would go after the vampire after making sure that they have the right precautions and the right weapons and the right spells. However, that is not what this group did. Next week, they decided, actually, we don't want to go after Lyvander Jackson. You had too many NPCs tell us that it was going to be too hard, and we believed you. So that was kind of like, that was a mistake on my part. Right? I was trying to do this reverse psychology thing, and uh, you know, I, I overcompensated, and they just said, well, let's just not do it. But I'm not really mad at myself or mad at them, certainly, because it shows this is what heroes would do. This is what a normal D&D &D party would do. They would go slay the monster. You guys have decided your nobles have other interests in the world. You're more interested in setting up for the auction that's going to be in a few weeks. You're more interested in seeking out these podlings. So you're not going to go after vampires. So at first, I was kind of beating myself up about, ah, eh, I really shouldn't have. I overplayed my hand with, like, saying, don't go after the, the vampire. It's, it's too hard for you. So they listened to me. But now I'm really happy with the way things went. So... I guess the lesson there uh, is don't try to play too many mind games with your players, one, and two, kill your darlings. Uh, if, if you are really excited for this vampire fight and then the players just don't want to do it, uh, don't, don't get too mad about it. My advantage here was I hadn't sat down and plotted out a, a three-hour vampire fight. Uh, I had said, okay, they're probably going to go to Lyvander, so I'll be ready for that when it gets there. Let me review the stat block. You know, I had maybe spent five minutes prepping for that, so I also didn't really lose anything. But let's see what I had to do next session when suddenly, uh, you know, the thing that I thought was going to happen wasn't there. Camellia, Light, and Reth meet up with Zatan on the Ruby Road. They all decide not to go after Lyvander, sensing that he is not the true force behind the auction attack, and they are all more worried about Ivana's podlings spreading out in the world. Based on the belongings of those the body of the body <laughs> Based on the belongings of those the body stealer plants slain, they might be able to find four podlings in the area. Their clues are a short sword bearing the Tatana sigil, a Parliament Guard's longsword, a Mistwatcher's flail, and a Duelist's rapier. Quick note here, and why I felt it was important to just put this in the session recap, you, you want there to be a mystery, but you shouldn't want to obscure your clues. Uh, I've had games before 
where where I put a clue in a loot pile or, or something important that an NPC said and maybe that NPC died or, or they're just not in this city. And then the players have been like, what was that thing that they said? And I'll be like, I don't know. Maybe you should have written it down. Ha ha. And I, I, I cringe at myself now because like, what does that do? Other than saying, ha ha, I'm the DM. You should be good players. You're just making the game the fun parts of the game that you want to get to the cool reveals you're making that harder to access uh to access uh so you know i could tell that my players were kind of having struggle and we don't meet up every week uh you know i could tell that they were having a hard time looking back and going like what was the four clues that we had identified being like who the far podlings might be uh and and i just kind of said Hey guys, I think you have this somewhere in your notes. Uh, it's this one, this one, this one, and this one. And then they were like, "Oh, that's why I wrote these down over here." Okay, guys. Okay, guys. Uh, let's let's figure this out. So, you know, bottom line: if you have if you have something important, if you have an important clue, an important location, I'm not saying scream that to the heavens every session, but you can highlight it a little bit. You can just kind of shine a light over in that corner and say, "Oh, can, do you remember that one thing?" and make it easier for them to play the game that you are offering. Camellia spots a strange figure holding a lantern in the dark forest. The figure beckons them in Elvish, asking them to bring warmth back to the heart. The party follows cautiously. Light and wrath determine the figure to be an undead flame skull. This is not the same flame skull that Lord Light found hiding in the Pietra estate, or rather was being hidden by Pratima in the Pietra estate. Uh, that is one risk you will run if you're running two of the same monster, or even let's say you don't use, uh, you know, NPCs of different species, and you say, ah, the tiefling blacksmith, and then later it's like, ah, you see a tiefling mob lord, and they'll be like, that's the blacksmith! Like, no, it's better to, to clarify, you know, spice up the descriptions. In this case, because I had said before, like, oh, the flame skull in the Pratima castle, uh, they had this heavenly, this yellow-white glow to their flame and this one has a colder blue glow to their flame so use those descriptions to try to differentiate your npcs your monsters your clues your settings beyond just here is the main keyword in their stat block after a few miles along an overgrown road they find the cheery village of evanburn the village's inhabitants are unusually cheery for Bork and small folk, boasting a bountiful garden of spring vegetables despite a fall climate everywhere else. The villagers have apparently cut off ties with Lev Carest and the outside world, and haven't heard from their Ozanic patrons since Klaus Baritzi's death two years prior. Okay, so I'm establishing kind of a new setting for this session. First off, I just want to say again, uh, I thought that this was going to be the suit up montage to go fight Lyvander next session. And that wound up not being the case because they said, we don't care about the vampire. We're not going to go fight him. He can keep eating people. That's fine. So I needed something random. This was completely on the fly. And yet it wasn't because I took the time to set up my random encounters with ideas that I liked, and I assigned those to the magic cards. I passed out those magic cards at the beginning of the session once I knew that they didn't want to go kill Lyvander, and they, you know, handed some back to me, and from the two that they handed back, I'm like, let's go for this one. This is something that my brain can work with tonight. Uh, Evan Byrne didn't exist until right then. Uh, I had I had to come up with a name of town, but I'm like, okay, they're in this area. It's going to be controlled by this noble house because I want to tie back in the nobles. Remember, that is the theme. Those are kind of the dark lords of Borco. We have two that are big, Ivan and Ivana, but the nobility overall, they are the horror around this land. Uh, so we learn that this place has 
you know, not heard from the Ilzanics. The Ilzanics have essentially abandoned this place, and now there's some weird stuff going on. There's some extra little notes in these recaps. I'll be, I'm not really doing a play-by-play -play of, like, every role that was made. Uh, as they were going into town, they were actually talking to a lot of NPCs. They were doing a lot of detect magic and, and insight checks, because they they were sure that there was some kind of illusion in this town, that the flame skull might have dragged them into uh, a different demiplane or something. They were really, really off on that something was magical here. And it is something magical, but I think it brought out the horror aspect more for me to say, okay, you're doing all these checks. This is good. Uh, there's something magical afoot, but it's more of a transmutation aura than like an illusion or an enchantment this place this place is real whatever magic is going on here it has been made real and establish that at the front so that at the end of the session a player doesn't have this moment where they're like and i break the illusion and then you're like it was never an illusion it was an illusion the whole time uh establish that up front let them you know let them play the game let them use the tools of their characters to find the answer but figure it out kind of early on moving on the party leverages their noble status to request a night's stay in the noble lodgings used by the Olzanix in the past. The town's champion, Lorenz, is cagey towards the request and instead offers his own hound. Uh, have all these names come up, like Lorenz? Um, I use the, <laughs> the name tables in the back of... Xanathar's Guide to Everything, a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I especially love that they break it down by different cultures, so it's like, okay, I'm gonna get a more German vibe on this town, I'm gonna, and I tend to use a lot of Zer German and Slavic names in the Borka setting in general, uh, but I will kind of mix up like, okay, this elf isn't going to have an elvish name, this elf is going to have one of the German human names because i i want to portray this land and in, in pretty much any setting that i have unless i'm being super specific like theros as it's kind of a melting pot your elves aren't aren't just growing up and teaching themselves you know sometimes an elf grows up with a bunch of humans so they're gonna have a name like lawrence instead of thranduil uh and by the way, this is established in Tasha's, and this is honestly the the direction that D&D &D is going, and probably the direction that, that you sh can go. I can argue with somebody about that in the comments. Camellia sets off on another distraction, allowing Rhett some time to investigate the Noble Lodge's grounds. Meanwhile, Light explores the local shrine to Ezra and finds the hero, healer, Dorothil. The young elven woman is sending away her cold thoughts of her lost love with Lawrence, who suddenly broke their 120-year courtship after returning from a quest up north. Light finds this behavior curious, and Zatan disguises himself as Lawrence to torment Dorothil while buying the group more time alone at the Noble Lodge. This was really, really cool. Uh, you may have noticed from this recap, this party is getting split up all the time. They're all going in different directions, they all have different motivations, and even when they're unified in trying to solve what is the mystery here, how can we, we do what the Flame Skull wants us to do or not do because the Flame Skull may be putting us into a trap, uh, they're, they're all going about it in different ways and using different features. Uh, and that is something that I want to allow in this game, because in session zero, I set the tone that these are all competing houses, that you can have ulterior motives as a character to approach this the way you want to. Uh, I'm letting this happen, and one thing that I'll do is, you know, I'm kind of encouraging a vibe where we're, you know, uh, we're being entertaining with our role play. So if you're sitting there and it's not your turn, you're having fun because you're seeing what your friends are doing. That's cool. If I if I see that two characters are really chatting in character and, and I have an NPC around or I don't have an NPC around, a lot of the times I will kind of... I will kind of butt out and I'll just stay silent and I'll make some notes or I'll secretly roll up uh, my D100 next elf name because Dorothil is a character we need. Um... 
There's all kinds of tricks you can do with splitting up the party. I think Critical Role was actually a really positive example for me in being able to do this rather than saying you have to go to the dungeon together. You have to stick together, never split the party. Like, sometimes it's fun for everyone to, to go in different directions and see what happens, but you still, as a DM, coordinate that all together into one direction because ultimately it is kind of a team game. One other thing that I want to mention here. So we we already have a lot of plot threads. Uh, you have this guy, Lawrence, who's being suspicious. You have this noble lodge uh, that, you know, that he's saying keep out of. You have Dorothil, who has these, like, cold memories that she's sending away of Lawrence and, like, putting suspicion on him. And then you have this, you know, what is it that the Flame Skull is is trying to stop here? What is going on with the town? So all these kind of interweaving mysterious aspects of this town... I completely made up on the fly. As soon as my party like handed me back those two magic cards and I picked the one that was going to be the semi-random encounter of the night, I started going off on this. How do I do that? Am I a master storyteller? No, I, I don't think so. I have the benefit of a whole lot of experience of running a whole lot of D&D for people, so I can sometimes pluck out little things that I've done before. This time I didn't do any of that. This time, I kind of let the players guide where they were going. Uh, you know, they asked who, who the nobles were responsible for this place, and I had already determined really early on, oh, it's the old Xanax who you went to the fake auction with. They would be the ones in this area who would watch out for, for this little mining town. Uh, okay, so they start asking questions like, well, where's the mine? Where do the old Xanax stay when they come here? They must have a place. And I would go, ah, yes, that would be a thing. That detail didn't come from me. I didn't have to invent that as part of this town. I let the players guide me to the right answer, and then I made that answer real in the world. This is a good trick that you can use. This is using some classic improv yes and storytelling. You're doing it with more people. As long as you start to accept your players as co-authors in the story you are telling, this is the kind of magic that you can do without putting stress on yourself. Rhett successfully breaks into a cellar bearing an icy passage. The party reconvenes and creates illusory cover for further delving, even employing Jaxie as a lookout. Uh, I really like Jaxie as an NPC because myself and the characters will often forget that Jaxie, the kobold that turns into a dragon wing bow at night, is, is not there. Like, they will forget about him. Uh, and, and I decided early on that Jaxie was going to be, like, a, a, a kobold with seven charisma. Uh, so sometimes we'll be like, wait a minute, can we use Jaxie for this? And, and I'll just be like, oh, hey, hey, I was on your back, I'm here in your quiver. It's okay, I was taking a nap. Do you guys need something? Like, he's just completely uh, chill about it. And they're like, Jaxie, what are you doing? And he's like, uh, yeah, I got some thieves tools. I got a dagger. And they're like, oh, so you're you're a talented rogue. You're a talented dungeon demon. And he's like, no, no. I just like breaking stuff. The other guys would rob it. They would bring it back to me and say, Jaxie, I can't unlock this. And I would pop it open. But, you know, anytime there's a lock, as long as it's during the day, because at night, Jaxie is a bow, the party can say, ooh, hey, Jaxie, can you fix this? Because that's one thing they were lacking on their party checklist was like, uh, someone with proficiency in thieves tools. So Jaxie serves a purpose, but he he never, I hope, overstays his welcome. He's he's always just kind of there when they need him. They find the entire basement of the Noble Lodge covered in a magical rhyme, uh, which I had to clarify for them. So I'll clarify for y'all. Rhyme is 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 ice. It's my fancy word for ice. Uh, which Zatan identifies as summoned from the Nine Hells. Reth silently skulks ahead until he enters a room bearing an insectoid ice devil. The devil, Udrenir, 
is seen telepathically taking on the complaints and pains of Evanburn's citizens to strengthen his fiendish hold on the land. When Reth takes the Devil's Spear using Mage Hand, he slips on the plentiful ice and alerts Udranir to the party's presence. A tense combat ensues, but Reth uses his feline agility to flee back to Jaxi, where Lawrence has just walked by and heard the sounds of blasting spells. So again, I set up these interweaving mysteries. We're having a combat, but I want to find a way to bring back some of those main points, and Lawrence was a main point of suspicion. I wanted to see what they would do if he shows up. Are they going to trust him? as the town's champion and guard, or are they going to immediately assume that he's in league with this ice devil who is taking the cold thoughts uh, of this cold mining town and turning it into a warm springy place? Camellia quickly summons a flame blade, but Udrenir is too familiar with the fires of hell to be harmed by elemental flame. Zatan and Light fare better with their magics, and Camellia changes to her starry performance with a salvo of guiding bolts and starlit blasts. It kind of sucks as a player to be like, ooh, 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 I have a cool idea. Here's the thing I can do. That's an ice devil. I'm going to have fire. And I'm looking at the stat block and I'm like, he's immune to fire. I'm going to let it stand. I'm not going to change the stat block on the fly. Uh, he's immune to fire. But I, I want to let the player know immediately, like, hey, the fire's not going to work. Uh, you know, I'll describe it through the fight scene uh, to say that you you deal zero damage because I don't want them to sit there for three rounds and 30 minutes of game time thinking, why, why is this not working? I want to tell them immediately, and because I told them immediately uh, through in-game uh, text, not, you know, she was able to change up her battle plan and keep having fun rather than keep losing using her flame blade. At the cellar, Reth and Jaxi manage to knock out and bind Lawrence, freeing up Reth to return to the true fight. While without his ice spear, Udrenir proves formidable, with his tail and claws soon capturing Zatan. The devil offers a deal. The party can take his spear and Zatan's life and leave Udrenir to his peaceful devices in Evanburn. After all, are the citizens not happier with Udrenir's influence? The party hesitates. Udrenir doesn't favor this response and throws Zatan as he attempts an escape. Camellia catches Zatan safely and Light sends out the full might of his song-empowered gold coin, ending the devil and the curse upon the town. He finds a stone of mastery being used as the focus for the late Ice Devil's cursed deal, and the party agrees Light may take the prize. Outside, Evanburn wails. The crops deteriorate and the sky darkens as all of their postponed bad feelings return to them. The only one unaffected is Dorothil, the village's saddest inhabitant. The party advise her to take care of things and hope that some of their souls may be salvaged from damnation. Because they did make a bunch of de deals with the devil for two years. Light prepares a letter to the old Xanax, making them wary of the neglected town that can now use their noble funding once more. Then again, they should have a burgeoning enterprise with a new Twinkle Tush fad going around. Ah, uh, so... I forgot about this. Um, Lord Light, the Ritters in in the book, in Van Richten's, are said to be like the, the fashionistas, uh, the, the sewers and seamstresses of Borka. And for his background trait, Light's character said, I am the trendsetter. You know, once per day or once per week or whatever, I don't care. Um, I can kind of say this is fashion now, and he might use this to get out of a trick. Like, if they show up to a, a party and they're covered in gore because they just killed somebody, he can be like, uh, this is actually what's in. Why aren't you all covered in p fake pig's blood? 
Uh, and in this case, following what happened with Reth at the Piechitas when he was determining who was Harrier, they decided that Twinkle Tushes are now going to be a fad for the tailed inhabitants of Vorka. And I love it. Party leaves Evanburn with Lawrence's body in tow. The elf's podling nature was revealed in his unconsciousness. Lawrence was the bearer of that duelist rapier, and he never truly came back from his quest up north. The party briefly questions the podling, who seems to desire his peaceful life in Evanburn, and vocally regrets not being able to love Dorothil as the true Lawrence once did. Sensing no further use for the podling, and no good from him returning to Evanburn, the party dispatch him. The flame skull that beckoned them offers them thanks. Their fire dispels and the skull drops to the forest moss. The true Lawrence put to rest. So that is going to wrap up this little section of Balls of Borka. I hope you're enjoying it and I hope there's something in here to make your game better. Uh, <laughs> I, I am still kind of Shocked by myself being able to make up that entire Evan Byrne session on the fly, uh, I am going to give myself a pat on the back for that one. I do want to say overall, uh, I think that the campaign ha has a lost sense of direction that I would like to get a better grip on. Uh, I want to kind of... Reese's, okay, here is what we're going for. Here are the Dark Lords that you will either have to defeat or find favor with. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of nice that I haven't had to have that. It's nice that we are all, all five of us, just kind of having fun in this sandbox. We all have our different entries going, myself and the players that we're trying to, to guess and play games with. Uh, people are texting each other on the side for what's going to happen next week. Uh, there's a lot going on. I do want to slow up on the number of random encounters that I've had, on the number of new names and NPCs to keep up with. I want to, kind of like with Evanburn, where I, I made this nice little story, but we, we tied it in a bow, they got rid of a podling, uh, they brought something back to the old Zanuck house, you know, I want to have more closed threads or more interweaving threads than just more and more open threads, infinitely expanding universe out there. Uh, because I can say right now, I don't know what the ending of Borka is, but I do like that. I like not knowing the end. I like just playing around with my friends and see where we take each other in D&D. Uh, I hope that you enjoy that, too. Without any further ado, please have a nat 20 day. Bye-bye.